God, we were speaking on words last week, so we're going to tie right into that and go right into confession. Hallelujah. And we may cover some ground. You know, it's kind of hard sometimes to share certain things and not recover the same ground, but that's okay. Uh, if we don't mind, can we get a little more air in here? As soon as you turn all the lights on, as soon as you turn the, all the lights on, it gets hot. And, uh, I wish they could come. Maybe they do. Maybe we need to get, find uh, the LED lights that are yellowish. Uh, they don't put out the heat. These bad boys put out some heat. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. We can set that center, center camera to static and if you want to and just use the side one. Having problems with it? With the cable. Okay. All right, they're going to try swapping cables. Well, let's go right in here. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Uh, ready back at verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Our words, as we said last week and the week before, have power. Our words have authority. Our words are strong. Our words carry with them uh, future. They, they, our words are uh, carriers of our future. In other words, the words of our mouth govern our lives. What you say is what you get. Amen. You don't like what you got, change what you've been saying. And somebody say, Shanda. Yeah, hallelujah. See, if you don't have... If I had to inspire you to say, Shandai, you're not an old charismatic. If you say it without any prompting, you're an old charismatic. It means you're, pre, you're pre-1985, at least, probably more like pre-1980. Glory to God. Psalm 19, uh, the psalmist says in verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let your words and your meditations, you see what you, your meditations have to be uh, right so that the words will be right. I got one agreement there. Your words have to be right, and the only way you're going to get them right is to make sure your meditations are right. If your meditations are wrong, if you're meditating on Oprah, you're not going to have the right words. Or Dr. Phil, or Bill Meyer, or Jimmy Kimmel or whoever else, you know, you, you know people ever like to listen to. <clears throat> if you're feeding on that all the time, if you're feeding on who, who slept with who and who shot who all the time, you're not going to have the right words in the hour of need. Somebody say amen. amen. You've got to have the right words. So that the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Can somebody say glory? glory. Isaiah 59, 21 says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth. God wants to put the right words in your mouth. God wants to put good words in your mouth. God's giving you his word so that you can feed on it, meditate on it, and get it in your mouth. Can you say glory? And God made it easy. I said God made it easy. See, we spend so much time trying to figure stuff out and make it complicated. God made it easy. He gave you the Bible. Now, he didn't give you Aunt Louise. You know, brother, uh, Uncle Leroy. Any of those people that, you know, they, well, I think this and I think that, that don't help you any. Are y'all here? What, what they think doesn't help you. You've got to have the Word of God in you. So that you can pull out the right things and have the right meditation so you can have the right words. <coughs> and so they said, they shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. Now let me say this. There's a, there's a statement they used to make. I remember when I was growing up, you know, parents would do something and they'd beat their kids for doing it. And then you'd say, well, you just did it. You don't do like I do. You do like I say do. That is not Bible. A believer is to train up his children in the way they go. Amen? We are to live examples in front of our kids. We're to live the example of faith. 
We're to live the example of love. We're to live the example of, of, of the word of God in front of our kids because you're not going to teach them, telling them to do it, and then you, you do something different. And when they call you on it, you give them that, that, old, that old saying, you don't do like I do, you do like I say do. Hate to tell you, pal, they're going to do like you do. Hello. How many remember the commercial from the old... Oh, the, the late 60s, early 70s, the dad's out there by a tree smoking. And the kid comes down and sits down by, beside him. He gets up and walks off, leaves a pack of cigarette. The kid picks it up. And they go like father, like son. You know, the example is what people are going to, what kids are going to follow. They're not going to follow just you telling them. You know? No, one, one time somebody, that they, had a, they, they, were, they weren't going to church. And the kid came in and, and they, they said, well, you got to go to church. And they said, why? You don't go. And they got all mad at the kid for saying that. I mean, blew up. You don't, you know, you you don't do that. You go and whether I, I'm doing right or not. Well, that's not the right example. You can't. You, there's no excuse for not being the right example. So here he says that this word's not to part out of your mouth, out of your children's mouth, or your grandchildren. That's seed and seed seed. That's, that's children, grandchildren. So we, we want people and leaders in our households that live an example, so that it's carried on through the family. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it's supposed to be that way forever. Amen. So don't, don't, don't stay home and be a bum and expect your kids to be, be diligent about the things of God. And can we get a, a halfway amen on that one? Amen. No, there's, there's a calling of God. And when you're raising children, you've got to be the example that, that God has called you to be. Hallelujah. All right, so words have authority, words have power. Jesus, look over Mark's gospel, the 11th chapter. Mark chapter 11. Hallelujah. Verse 12, it says, On the morrow when he came from Bethany, they were hungry. He was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, uh, having leaves, he came happily. He might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And actually, this tree had budded its leaves pre-season. It, it had actually borne the leaves earlier than it should. It was rep the re leaves represented that it had figs. Jesus answered. In other words, it said, I got figs. It got there. I want no figs. So Jesus answered it saying, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Listen to this. And the disciples heard it. Let me, let me say something. Uh, I recently had a question from, from a relative uh, about silent prayer. And, um, you know, can Satan read our mind? And, and the answer to that, Satan cannot read your mind. However, on the other side of that, I don't believe in silent prayer. Sitting and thinking with God is not prayer. The kingdom of God was established on speaking. And God said, light be, light was. God said, let this take place and that took place. God said. So the kingdom of God is, is established upon the principle of words having authority and power. Therefore, they must be spoken. Everybody say amen. We are, the Christianity is referred to oftentimes as the great confession. Jesus is the high priest of our profession, so it can be also translated confession. It's what we speak that has authority. Amen? Thinking toward God is, is not, you know, some people say, well, that's meditation. And quite frankly, that's not even meditation. The word to meditate in the Hebrew means to mutter. You know, how many have ever muttered before? Yeah, you've muttered. You've gone to the counter. And they, 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 they gave you a hard time at the fast food counter, and you walk up, who do they think they are talking to me? I mean, and you, you, what are you doing? You're muttering. See, we're to mutter the Word of God. Even, even meditation is not just thinking, it's speaking. So the kingdom of God is established on principles of a, a words having authority, and we speaking those words in faith. Somebody say hallelujah. All righty. And so... We, we have to understand that. So the disciples did what? They heard it. You know, I've, I've talked to people before, and they say, well, I'm just praying. You know, well, you're not saying anything. Well, I'm, I, you know, and they get mad at you. Well, you're, you're not praying. 
And, and I don't mean this to be harsh, but, you know, honestly, you're not getting anything done. You might be thinking, but you're not praying. You've got to speak to get things released with authority. The words have the power. Now, we're told to bring every thought into captivity until the obedience of Christ. Why? Because those thoughts left, left long enough will turn into words. Amen. You think on it long enough, you're going to say it. Now, my father-in-law, he'd sit around. And he'd get something on his mind. He'd think about it for hours. I mean, he'd be sitting at the counter, and, and, and the, uh, they, the uh, house they built, he, they built two counters. You know, you could sit down with a bar stool, and one you could use kind of a prep counter and eating counter. The other was an eating counter. And uh, he'd sit there at night, and he'd just be thinking. He wouldn't say anything for hours sometimes. Just think. And you know something's going on in that head. And, and, and I'm, I'm married to the clone. I'm just going to tell you. They thinking, they thinking, they thinking, they thinking. And after hours, all of a sudden, just out of the blue, they'll say something. You're going, where'd that come from? It came from the, the six hours of thinking about it. Okay? I mean, they might just interject something in the middle of, of a conversation and got nothing to do with it. But they've been meditating on this. I mean, they've been, not, not meditating. They've been thinking on it. And those, those thoughts took hold and finally became words. And you see, a lot of time in our Christian world, we think about things. That's why, we're to, that's why we're to bring our thoughts into captivity. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth to bring every thought into captivity to the, to the obedience of Christ. Why? Because eventually those thoughts are going to take on the form of words. And that is when they have power and authority. The thoughts don't have power and authority until they are formed with words and released out of the mouth of the person who's speaking them. Then they take on, then they take on authority. So Jesus spoke to the tree. The Bible says he answered it. Because see, when it, said it had figs, it said I, when it had leaves, it said, I got figs. He got there and there figs. So he responded and said, no man's going to eat it for you hereafter forever. And the disciples heard him. Then they went on the way, went into town, um, you know, run the money changers out of the temple, all that stuff. That means you can't sell things in the church. It means you can't abuse the people and rip the people off and rape the people which is what they were doing at the temple marketplace. They were abusing their power and making them buy spotless lambs that they said were spotless, even when they brought, when they brought one that was spotless. If these people grew up and they knew what was spotless, what they knew what spotless was. They knew, what they, they knew what they had to bring for sacrifice, but the priesthood was ripping them off. Sounds like, some kind of, sounds like our government sometimes. Oh, did I say that? Uh, excuse me. You know? Tell you what you can't do, and then you got to do this and that kind of stuff, and all the crazy stuff that the government tries to do. And you know, I'm, I'm thanking God that we did have a constitution. We're going to find, we're going to live according to our constitution. In Jesus' name, Hallelujah! But see, the, the priesthood had become a corrupt system. That's what Jesus said. My house was to be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves because the people were coming in. They say, "No, that's spot, that's spotted. You can't use that. We got one right over here in the tip of marketplace. We'll sell you." You know. For, the, for the, the cheap price of $39.99. That's five times more than I, pay, I have for my own. That's all right. You've got to have the right one. You've got to have the sacrifice offered. And because they had to offer the sacrifice, there was no way around it. They had to buy it buy, buy because the, the priest said they, they were not spotless. And so because they said that, there was nothing they could do about it. So they, Jesus came in and got mad at them. Why? You're, you're abusing your position to rape and pillage the people financially. Okay. And he, he got mad, and I don't blame him. And I got news for you. If you're not preaching the truth for the right purposes and the right motives and have the right intents, you're doing the same thing. He's not happy with you either. When you, when you take advantage of his people. Hello. And so, you know, he does that, then they leave, they go back out, and then we get down to verse 20. Okay, so verse 19 says, And when the evening has come, he went out of the city. Verse 20, And in the morning as they pass by. So, you know, he goes in there. Rebukes the priest, rebukes the scribes, runs the money changers out. Hallelujah. Goes home and goes to bed. Hallelujah. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remember, now listen, <clears throat> we don't have any record of Jesus going over the tree and checking it out, do we? Jesus didn't run, oh man, look at the, I wonder if that tree's dead yet. 
It says as they passed by, Peter called to remembrance. He said, Master, the fig tree, you curse is withered. He stopped and went, man, look at me. Am I the faith king or what? I mean, I have got my faith working, baby. I want you to know, oh, man, I am a faith guy. Bring the offerings because I got faith. Come on now. You know, some people that right, right when that happens, they stop and take up an offering. My faith is working. My faith is powerful. I'm telling you, you can get answers from him. Let's take up an offering. Amen. And you know, people have a miracle, and then they want to stop and take up an offering. I'll tell you what, you're a charlatan. You don't take the miracles and the power of God and use it as a, 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 a prompting tool to milk the people for money. Let them give because, you know, you receive offerings, Yes. You receive offerings, and you teach on tithing, you teach on giving, and they do it out of a place of faith, but you don't do it because you've manipulated the thing or taken advantage of something God did supernaturally and had a powerful move of God or whatever, and then you're going to just jump in there and, and, and take up an offering. You've got to be careful. Dad Hagen, you say, watch out for the three Gs, the gold, the glory, and men, the girls. Either one of them will get you in trouble. Gold, glory, and girls. All the women just sitting there silent. Men aren't saying anything either. Master, behold, the fig tree you curse is withered away. And Jesus, here's what he says. He says, have faith in God. Now, my margin says, have the faith of God. So the same from the structure of the Greek. You can interpret it either way, faith of God or faith in God. In this particular case, have the faith of God. And I think it bears out with the rest of the Scripture. For verily I say unto you, now the word verily, is, is King Jimmy for uh, basically swearing or giving a solemn oath. All right? So Jesus says, have the faith of God, for I give you a solemn oath that whosoever. Now, how many, now let me just kind of help you out here before I ask this question. If you're breathing, you're a whosoever. Now, how many whosoever's do we have in this room? Four of you don't know it. All right, do that. If you could do that, raise your hand. You're a whosoever. All right? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. Now notice what he said you had to do. What did you have to do? You had to say. You had to open your mouth. And remember, Jesus didn't walk up to the tree and think. No man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. Now, two things would happen there. One is the disciples wouldn't have heard it, and two, Peter could not call to remembrance that the fig tree which he cursed was withered because he wouldn't have heard him say, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Y'all got that? They heard him. Therefore, he spoke it. And so, the exam so when, they, when they call to remembrance and say that, you know, whosoever, uh, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, you got to really, release words. You have to release words. Jesus released words. Those words were carriers of authority. And those words released authority, and the fig tree obeyed that and withered from the roots up. Hallelujah. And then when, they, when Peter mentioned that, Peter goes, I mean, Jesus goes, I am the Son of God, and I have done this thing to prove to you that I am sent from heaven to redeem mankind. Is that what he said? What he said was this, have faith in God. For I give you a solemn oath that whosoever shall say. He takes it as an opportunity to teach the authority of words vested in faith and getting results out of those words through faith. Amen. So he says, verily, or I, solemn, I give a solemn oath, or I swear, that whosoever... I mean, whosoever's right here. Remember the old church song, Whosoever surely meaneth me. Amen? Amen? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his, where? Heart. But shall do what? Believe, listen to what? That those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have what? whatsoever he saith. Not what he thinketh. 
Not what he hopeth. Not what he wisheth. I'm, I'm just going to go King Jimmy on you this morning. All right? Go Elizabethan. All right? Just use a bunch of ithists. But whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Did you, now let me say this. You know your head can be giving you a fit, but you have faith in your heart? Your head can be going tilt. You can be a pinball machine with all the lights going off. Bing, 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 tilt, 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 tilt. And your heart going, I got it. I got it. And your head screaming, how? And that's what happened with Mary. You, we, you, you'll bear a son. How shall this be seeing I know not a man? Her head was going tilt. How am I going to get pregnant without having sex? You know, we just, just make it a little plainer because some folks go, what were they talking about? They're talking about they had sex. She hadn't had sex. How am I going to get pregnant when I haven't sex? The Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. The Holy Ghost is going to come on you. Therefore, that thing that be born of you should be, should be called the Son of the Most High God. Amen? Her head was going tilt, but you know what she said? Be it unto me even as thou hast spoken. Amen? I said amen. Her heart had faith. Her head was tilting. You can have your head could be going nuts and, and tilting all over the place, but your heart could be saying, I got it. I got it. I got it. See, faith is of the heart, not of the head. That's why Jesus said, if you'll speak to the mountain and believe the things that you say shall come to pass and shall not doubt in your heart. Faith is spiritual. Faith is not head. It's not out of your head. It's not out of your thought processing. It is out of your heart. Faith is a spiritual force. And when you release, that's why, let me say this, that's why on the opposite of this, if you're saying things just because you heard it out of your head and there's no faith in your heart, they won't come to pass and you wonder why. Well, you're doing exactly what they did. No, 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 no. It may look like you're doing exactly what they did, but if it's not out of your heart, it's not working. If it doesn't come out of the spirit, if you haven't got faith in your heart, you can mimic me saying, I believe that I receive my healing now according to 1 Peter 2.24. And you can go, well, Pastor Ed did, I'll do it. I believe I receive my healing now according to 1 Peter 2.24. What does 1 Peter 2.24 say? I don't know. That's just what he said. Well, I know one thing. It's not in your heart then. The scripture reference doesn't produce faith. The scripture produces faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Y'all hear? So you can quote the scripture reference, but there's no faith in the scripture reference. Come on now. Now, if you're doing it and quoting, I believe that I received my, my healing now, according to 1 Peter 2.24, and then I go on to say, by whose stripes I was healed. Now, I'm, I'm basing it on the scripture itself. I'm just giving, for my own sake, the reference to where you find it. Okay, when, when it was written and people were stepping into those things, standing on those things in the beginning, they weren't references. They didn't have references. Remember the Bible says that they gave him, Jesus, the book of the prophet Isaiah, and really the scroll, and he opened it and found the place where it was written. The spirit, well, that's Isaiah 61. We, well, that's easy for us to refer to. But Jesus didn't look to Isaiah 61. He went through the scroll until he found the actual scripture. And, said this, and he didn't quote the reference because they didn't have it. He just began to read from it and said, The Spirit of the Lord's upon me, for he's anointed me. To, you know, and then he goes on and quotes the rest of that. Amen? So hearing someone say, I believe that, you know, I'm, I'm the healed of the Lord according to 1 Peter 2, 24, and you walk out and you're saying that, and, and you're, you're really doing it from your head, it's not coming out of your heart, you don't even know what the Scripture says. See, faith, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you're going to have to know what 1 Peter 2, 24 says. Amen? who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins uh, should uh, be saved, by whose stripes we were healed. By whose stripes we were healed. Now, as I feed on by whose stripes I am healed, and I feed on Matthew 8, 17, that it might be fulfilled by that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Isaiah 53, 5, by whose stripes we, were, we are healed. When I'm, and I have the references to them, but I have to know what the Word says. And see, Jesus said that whosoever shall say unto the mountain. Now, the mountain is figurative. Now, you can go over here to Mount, uh, 
Mount Everest. And stand at the foot of Mount Everest and all day long cast that into the sea. It ain't going anywhere. Because Jesus wasn't really talking about figurative, literal mountains. I mean, he wasn't talking about literal mountains. He was talking figuratively. Mountains in your life being obstacles, being issues, being circumstances. Amen? You know, he says, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can stand to the sick of my tree, be plugged up and be cast into the sea. He's, he's talking about, in, in, in allegorical and figurative speech, about things that are in your way. Amen. Now, number one, there's no reason to put Mount Everest in the ocean. Come on now. There's no real reason to put it there. I mean, you're going to mess up about your people because then they can't climb it. Hello? You have no biblical reason to do something like that. All right. You got, people get foolish. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put Mount Mitchell into the ocean. Please don't. I like going up there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to resist you and keep putting it back. If you put it in, I'm putting it back. No, that's foolish. We have to understand that, the, that the, he was right. He was speaking in figurative terms about, about mountainous circumstances that were so big they looked like mountains. But Jesus said if you have faith, you can speak to that mountain. Say, be removed and be put to the sea and doubt not in your heart and it shall obey you. It's going to do what you said. You have what you say. So you've got to speak to the mountains of life. Your words have authority and power to speak to the mountains of life. Amen? Sickness, uh, uh, financial issues, you know, calamity, troubles that come against you. There are scriptures that cover where you are. Amen? There are scriptures that cover where you are. And if you'll find those and take them in your mouth and believe in your heart, then that's actually faith comes out hearing, hearing by the word of God. You begin to speak those words of life, speak those words of faith, then the circumstances of life must obey you. He goes on, it says in verse 25, uh, and when you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Now, it's very really interesting. The word lust and the word desire are the same Greek word. And it means strong desire, strong wanting. See, we have to desire the things of God. Amen. Now, there's evil lust and there's biblical, you know, evil desire or evil lust, evil, uh, biblical desire, biblical lust. The Spirit of God lusteth the envied. Okay? So we have to understand that the words don't, when you say lust, it doesn't mean necessarily evil or, or, or sinful. It has to be in the context of what's saying. And here he says, what things shall you desire when you, when you pray? Now, folks, you have to take this in balance. What things shall you desire? You can't desire somebody else's spouse. That's unbiblical. That's wrong. Remember, it's one of the top ten. Hello? It's one of the big ten. Letterman didn't start the top ten. Jesus did. I mean, God did with Moses up in the mount. All right? You know? And one of the top ten is, I shall not cover thy neighbor's wife. And so when, when he says here, what things shall you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. We well, see, you've got to have Bible for what you're speaking or desiring. The Word of God must be the thing that produces your desires or governs the things you desire. Now, don't just bobble ahead for me this morning. Come on. Now, see, if I was telling you you're going to get rich by giving an offering this morning, you're going to have a million dollars next week, you'd be shouting and running and throwing money all over the place. Come back here and tell you you've got to govern what you desire, and y'all sit like a bunch of not on the... Come on now, it's true. The Word of God governs how, the things you desire. The Word of God is, is a governor over the things you desire. If you're desiring things that aren't Bible, you can't have them. Hello. Well, I, I, I've shared this story before. I'd love to share it because I had a girl call me one time in the office and, and say, can I talk to the pastor? Well, I, you got him. Uh, I need some help here. And she began to talk to me about the fact she had a, uh, she didn't say this, but I, I kind of figured she had the hots for some guy in the church. And he was an elder in the church. And then I asked her a few questions after a while and finally, finally figured out, you know, that she hasn't even, they haven't even gone out, they haven't dated, they haven't talked, hadn't communicated. But, she, you know, she, the Lord showed her they're going to get married. The Lord, he did. Really? Yeah. I said, well, uh, I didn't say honey. I, I said, have you talked to your pastor about it? No, I can't talk to him about it. Well, why? Well, the man is married.
Now, before I thought, before I could stop my mouth, I said, you had too much pizza last night. That was an indigestion prophecy and an indigestion dream because the Bible is not going to show you you're going to get some other woman's husband. God's not going to tell you you got somebody else's, so that some other woman's husband is going to be your husband and he's going to prophesy it to you and share it with you and it's going to come to pass. And you call with me to get me to try to get in on your sin. Go take some Pepsi AC and leave me alone. I didn't tell her that. Thought it, but I didn't. Anyway, see, there's no Bible for having someone else's spouse. There's no Bible for having my car. I have what I say. Now, only, see, listen, when Jesus said, what things shall you desire when you pray, you, uh, believe that you receive them and you shall have them, it is within the parameters of faith, and faith comes by hearing the word. Therefore, if it's not Bible-based, you can't have it. Hello? So we've wasted a lot of energy in the church using what we thought was faith and speaking things and making declaration of things that the Word of God does not promise us, guarantee us, or even condone. And we wonder why we don't get the answers. I can tell you why you're not getting the answer. Because you don't have Bible on it. Say, we love Pastor Ed. Amen. Now, go get the scripture that supports what you're believing for. To get enough Bible that faith can be produced so you can speak out of a heart of faith, not out of a heart of copying someone else or a heart that the Bible won't even support. Start speaking things the Bible won't, won't, can't even come close to promising you. Some guy told Brother Hagin one time, he was getting out of his Ford Bronco, the board at bottom of Bronco, back in the uh, late, late 70s, early 80s. And the guy said, take care of my Ford Bronco. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the Bible says I can have what I say. So I've confessed I have your Ford Bronco. He said, well, i got something to do with it, and the Lord's already told me something. He said, what did the Lord tell you? He said, keep it. You can't go confess to somebody else's car into your hands. Hello? Stay, stay with what the Bible says. Now, that being said, so the mountains of life are the circumstances that are contrary to you walking out the things of God, contrary to the Word of God, contrary to what the Word promises you, and you can take the Word of God and overcome that mountain by speaking faith. The words of your mouth having power and having authority as you speak what the Word says about it. Now, what the Word says about it is usually different than what the circumstance is. And it's a whole lot easier to believe the circumstance. If you're in pain, it's a whole lot easier to believe the pain. If you don't have any money in the bank, it's a whole lot easier to believe the money in the bank or lack thereof. If the bills are bigger than what you got coming in, it's a whole lot easier to believe the bills than it is what's coming in. This is where we got to take a hold of the Word of God. We've got to find Scripture. When it comes to finance, we've got to find Scripture that says that my God meets my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus and stand on the Word. We got to say that you know God uh, you know, uh, gives me gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower multiplies my seed sown and increases the fruits of my righteousness. Glory to God! Can you say Amen? amen. Hallelujah! That my God, you know, my God is my source. Hallelujah! Glory to God! That give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over. Men are given to your bosom. Glory to God! Bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you'll not have room enough to receive. Now the Hebrew actually says, "Empty out and you will bless you. You'll not have room enough to receive." Glory! I want to have more. I want you know. You know, Jesus said, "You know, whatever you ask the Father in my name, if I, you know, and here's the really, you know, um, He'll do it for you." The uh, I, there's one Bible, if you take it in a foreign language and translate it back in English, it, said, it says this, if you ask anything, that Father anything in my name, if I don't have it, I'll make it for you. Hallelujah. I like that. Glory to God. If I don't have it, I'll make it for you. Well, he has everything, but you know, just, it's just the, the import is there's nothing too great for our God. Hallelujah. And so we're going to get into faith. Amen. We're going to have more than enough. I mean, you're speaking of your finances, praise God. God, listen, it's time that we just get out from under the, the, the cloud of lack and the cloud of not enough and the cloud of what am I going to do and get into, the, get into the sunshine of the God who's more than enough. 
Hallelujah. Call on the God who, who appeared and said, I am the Almighty God to Abraham. And in the Hebrew, he says, I am El Shaddai. Glory to God. Now, the word Shad is the Hebrew word for breast. And, it Shaddai meant, and El Shaddai meant the many-breasted one. And what it literally means is this. I am the God who has more supply than you have need. I'm the God who's more than enough. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's the God that's more than enough. <clears throat> He's not El Chipo. He's El Shaddai. Come on now. Hallelujah. He's the God that's got more and more supply than you have need. In the New Testament, he says, well, that was Old Testament. Yeah, the New Testament says he meets our need exceedingly, abundantly, above all. We could ask or even think. How many of you ever got to thinking before? And your thinking got big. Anybody ever had big thinking before? I mean, you can lay in bed, all of a sudden, I mean, you're, you got your own, you know, $2 million yacht out in the middle of the Caribbean. I thought, you know, instead of doing vacation Bible school here, we'll all just pack up, go down to uh, um, uh, Royal Caribbean and have it on Coco K. Yeah, sounds good to me. Glory. Go snorkeling out there in the, in, in the cove. Glory to God. Amen. Now, if you don't like, if you don't like uh, per, not, uh, Barracuda, just chill out. Just run from them. Kids, kids are sitting up on the dock. And I'm down there swimming. All of a sudden, they said, you ain't never seen me move that fast. I reversed course right in the middle of snorkeling. Shoo, I was, they said, I walk it on water. <laughs> well, I was coming along, and, and all of a sudden, this barracuda turned and flashed its fin inside at me. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> Jesus, hallelujah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Come on and walk on the water with me. Boom, boom. All right, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Well, you know, but we've got to get a, we, we got to get back to we have revelations from the Word of God so that our mouth speaks faith, so that we, when we get into trouble and there's not enough, El Shaddai is who we call on. The God that's more than enough. The all-sufficient God. <coughs> Can you say amen? amen? Instead of, God, what am I going to do? You go, God, you got to do. Amen. amen. How many of you have ever been in a place where you just couldn't do anything about it? How many of you are in the place where you just can't do anything about it? Good. Paul said, moreover, therefore, I will rejoice, hallelujah, in my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest upon me, glory to God. Amen. But you see, you got to know what the Bible says to be able to say that. Right. Come on. And be in faith about it. And speak to your mountains. And therefore, what things you desire, what you strongly want, Coming out of the Word of God, believe that you receive them. Well, when you pray, that word pray is the Greek A I T E O. It is the same Greek word used over, I believe, in James' Gospel, the fourth chapter, where it says, You have not because you ask not. The word ask is A I T E O, same Greek word. So he said, Pray, ask in a different place. Prayer is talking. In this case, in Mark eleven twenty four, it's asking for something. So what things shall you ask for? Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Well, somebody say glory. We are going to, we're, we're, we're coming back to a place of faith. Amen. We, you know, listen, you know, I know individuals in the church have been attacked. Church has been attacked. But you know what? That's okay because we're still here. And we ain't going anywhere. We're, going, we're, we're not going. We will not go anywhere. We're only going over. Why? Because we're, 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 we're full of faith in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we're speaking. Listen, your finances have to turn around because you've got to speak to them. Yes. Amen. Yes. Good things have to come because you you're going to speak to them and declare it and make it happen because you speak to it. Amen. I said amen. Yes. Well, I sure wish it would. No, you can't wish. You've got to get full of faith. You gotta get a hold of the word of God. You gotta feed on the word of God. You gotta say what the word says. And you gotta say what the word says. And you gotta say what the word says. And what happens when I don't see anything changing? You gotta say what the word says. You gotta say what the word says. So you're so full of faith, nothing can come out but words of faith. Amen. I'm telling you, the apostle Paul was told that he had to see Rome. And they're on a ship. 
And he had told them, don't set sail. I perceive much danger will come to this ship. They did it anyway. Hello? Did you know you can have the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, God speak to you, and people will be boneheaded and won't listen to you? They'll go ahead and do it anyway. And then all of a sudden, and see, and Paul didn't run out there and say, I told you so. Well, he may have said, you should, you should have listened to me. But anyway. Now, I told you guys not to do it, but you did it anyway. But I, the Lord stood by me this night and said that not one life will be, not one life will be lost. The, the ship will be destroyed, but you won't, won't lose one life. Hello? Amen. See, he had already established that he was going to Rome. So he's going. This snake tried to bite him. He just shook it off into the fire. See, when you get a hold of faith and you get a hold of the answer, then you know what the end's going to, when you know what the end is going to be. You may not know all the process in between, but you know what the end's going to be. Ha, huh? because you know what the word says about it. When you know the end, you can stay steady in the storm. And Jesus got in the boat one day and said, let us go over to the other side. And he was asleep in the back of the boat when a big storm came up. And the boneheads showed up. That was his disciples. Remember them? Until they got later, further down the road, they were boneheads. They just didn't have it going on yet. They go back to the boat and wake him up. Jesus, Master, don't you care? Boy, it even got in on the fact he didn't care. That we perish. Woke him up out of a good sleep. See, faith can sleep in the middle of the storm. I said faith can sleep in the middle of the storm. Why? Because it's got perfect peace. Perfect peace have they that whose mind is stayed on thee. When you're restless mentally, you're out of peace. And you're out of peace because your mind's not on him. Now you can say amen, oh me, or help me, Lord. Whatever you want to say is fine with me right now. All there will be appropriate responses depending on where you are. All right? He's back there sleeping in the back of the boat. They get back and say, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he gets up, calms the storm, turns around, looks at him and says what? Let me put it in modern English. Wimps. He said, oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> Didn't he? Why did you doubt? What do, you, what do you mean you doubt? The storm came up. Yeah, but I said, let us go to the other side. The end was, we're going to the other side. If we had to flow, if we had to get out and walk on water, which he's done, hallelujah, and get, we're going to get to the other side because I said, let us go over to the other side. So the end of my faith is what? The other side. So I had no plans on perishing. This boat was taking us over. But you let the storms and the circumstances Govern your response more than my words. We do that oftentimes here. We let the circumstances of life govern what we respond to and how we respond more than what the word says to us. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just all kind of looking down, looking, look at me. Come on now. Amen. So what are we going to do? We're going to get in faith, aren't we? We're going to speak what the Word of God says. Hallelujah. Our faith, is, viable faith comes out of the Word. It does not come from what you think or what Aunt Louise told you. Because, see, growing up as a, as a good little Pentecostal boy, I knew, I knew that the Lord helps them that help themselves was in the Bible. How do you know? Because Grandmama quoted it all the time. Where'd she get that from? It's over in the book of first opinions. Hello? Y'all ever found that book in your Bible? Don't bother. It's not there. It's only in people's minds. Now, that, the, the, the scripture right after first opinions, chapter 2, verse 3, where it says the Lord helps those who help themselves, is what? Cleanliness is next to godliness. Amen. I mean, you, how many have you, old country folks used to this? And when you went out and played, you got the dirt rings on your neck and the little creases. They call them tater ridges for some reason. I don't know why. 
It was down in Eastern Carolina. You know, I guess on the on potatoes, they had dirt in them. You couldn't get them out real easy. So you had tater ridges. Yeah, and they tell you, cleanliness is next to godliness. You had to go get, them get, get that neck clean. You take a bath and come out, and they're still there. Like you just, you just kind of dived in the water and came out and dried off. That was good enough. How many, how many little boys or were little boys doing what I'm talking about? You know, you didn't, you didn't care. Just dive in, hop out, we're done. All the dirt came off on the towel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, they quote to you, cleanliness is next to God. This. And I'm going to tell you, when I first got saved, I was assured it was in the Bible. I knew it was in the Bible. Took a strong concordance and looked for both those scriptures for a week. Didn't have electric strong concordances back then. I took, I took my strongs and went through every word of those, those scriptures and looked for them and never could find them. Finally, after about a week of looking, I figured out they ain't in the Bible. I've been told that my whole life. I thought they were in the Bible. They weren't even in the Bible. Glory. So what do we do? We can't take an opinion. We can't take what somebody says. We can't even, listen, we might be somebody we trust with, 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 with great trust. You still have to be like a Berean. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so or not. The Berean Christians were more noble than Thessalonians because they went and they, they said, okay, I believe you, but now I'm going to prove it out. And here's, a bit, here's the important thing about proving it out because when you prove it out, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not what Pastor Ed said. Now you know for yourself the Bible says this, and you can stand in faith because the Bible says this. You can't stand on faith because I said it says this. You've got to know it for yourself. That's when you can stand against the mountain and say, be thou removed. Sickness go. Poverty go. This go in the name of Jesus. Because the word of God declares unto me that by his stripes I'm healed. The word of God declares unto me that you meet my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The word of God declares unto me that nothing shall separate me from the love of God. The word of God declares, and you begin to speak by faith and believe in your heart. And you're going to get it. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for the word of God. The word, it is our word, the word of life. It is that which produces faith in us and which causes us to be transformed and changed by your power. And that, Father, as we take the word of God and act on it in faith, we get the results the word promises us. And we thank you there's no mountain too big. There's nothing too great that we cannot overcome through faith in, the word, faith in your word. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we stand and we make our confession of faith and receive the answer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's all stand up. If you're here today, again, we want to give you an opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you're here today and you're not born again, would you, would you just take an opportunity at this moment to uh, raise your hand so we can see who you are? We want to pray with you. Anybody? You're not, you don't know Jesus? Anybody here you're born again, but you backslidden? That's not real hard to figure out. You know, we, we try to get real cute, you know, uh, you're out of fellowship, you're this. It's back, the Bible called it backsliding, so we'll call it what the Bible calls it. If you're backsliding, we want to pray with you. God said he'll restore or re, re, uh, actually heal is what the word was used, but mean restore your backsliding. You're here this morning, that's you. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. Anybody? Okay, so thank you. Anyone else? He said, I'm backsliding. I need to get right with God. You, you put your hand down. Thank you. Third call, you're here this morning. You're born again, love Jesus, but you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. We mean exactly what Acts 2 for us. They all filled the Spirit and began to speak in tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. If that's you this morning, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Want to be? Raise your hand. I'll pray with you too.